see everybody. Say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jeff Snyder. I'm the North Texas District Governor for the Texoma Region of Nats, and I am the Artist Series Chair for the 2019 Texoma Regional Nats Conference. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Artist Series number six, uh, which is called, as you can tell, I'm supposed to do a vowel with that by John Nix. A uh, little biography here, John Nix is Chair of the Voice Area and Professor of Voice and Voice Pedagogy at the University of Texas at San Antonio. He holds degrees in vocal performance from the University, the University of Georgia and the University of Colorado and a vocology certification from the University of Iowa. His current and former students have sung with the Santa Fe Opera, Opera Theater, St. Louis, Chautauqua Opera, Opera Omaha, Arizona Opera, Nevada Opera, the Soldiers Chorus, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the Metropolitan Opera Chorus, and on national Broadway tours. He was the 2006 Van Lawrence Award winner, has won grants from NIH and the Grammy Foundation, has published more than 40 articles, and edited or contributed to five books, including the new Oxford Handbook of Singing. John Nix. So you're supposed to start a presentation with a humorous anecdote. So for the third Nats conference in a row, I left my shoes at home, so you, you get running shoes. So there you go. So thank you for coming this morning, and I want to thank the conference organizing committee for picking me, and for my department chair, Dr. Tracy Cowden, for her support of our grad program. And most of all, um, my singing and teaching and research mentors, uh, Ingo Tietza and Barbara Dosher. So the format for today is pretty informal um, and interactive, and hopefully I'll balance it so that there's about an equal amount of me blabbing and an equal amount of you guys trying things out. So does everybody have a straw and a cup? C. C. Okay. So if you if you have not, they were on. They're up on the upper level. If you have not done so already, take a writing instrument and poke a small hole in the bottom of your cup. Just rend rendering it absolutely useless for any other purpose. Okay, so let's roll. So let's start with a brief review. What the heck is a semi-occluded vocal tract posture? Well, we're gonna try a few out and then maybe come up with a working definition after we've experienced them. Um, yeah, you know, they always say, you know, never follow children or animals, and I'm thinking also handing out toys at the beginning of a presentation, also not a good idea. Um, so can everybody hum on a M? Probably so, let's try. So we're gonna go, hmm, give that a try. And you can combine that with chewing motions at the same time. Give that a shot. Lovely. Okay. Uh, now let's try a siren on a Z. So like, give that a shot. Okay, good. How about a lip bubble? Same kind of siren. Good, good. Okay, how about a raspberry? So let's go back to that triad pattern. Give it a shot. Yes, I'm seeing the spit shield go up. Good, good. That, uh, for some, that may be a little less familiar. Okay, uh, now take your handy dandy straw, okay, and sealing your lips completely around the straw, just like you were gonna drink some water, and we're gonna do a siren through the straw. Okay, so, go for it. Cool. Um, now, one thing that some people do is they put the straw in their mouth and then they hum instead. So, for that, you can always take your fingers and make sure that you're actually singing out through the straw and not just having the straw in your mouth and humming, okay? Because that would be wrong. Um, you can also take your straw, and this is why I did not provide you with water, 
But you can take your straw and you can put it in some water for some bubbly fun. Okay, so it's a little extra resistance. Okay, now take your cup, right? And make sure that you're going to put it right up on your face and you're going to make sure that it seals around your mouth, okay? And we're going to do a triad on an A vowel. So, to sing right into the cup. How many of you have ever done that before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is pretty new for me too, but um, some people find that one effective. Okay, now take your index finger, put it up against your lips like this, and glide around. So, it's kind of like playing paper kazoo, you know, where you take a comb and you put a piece of paper. Those of us who are a little older remember doing that. Um, that was before cell phones and other things to entertain us. Um, here's another variation. Barbara Dasha used to call this the sleepy owl. Try that. Yeah, you kind of let your cheeks puff up. Okay, and uh, last, nothing that is unfamiliar to singers, uh, open your mouth. Okay, and then take the web of your hand and cover your open mouth so you're sealing it shut. Breathe through your nose for just a second like that. Okay, so now keep your hand there, don't move it. Now we're gonna do a triad on an A vowel right into your hand. Give it a shot. Right, so it's kind of a very sophisticated special way of humming. Okay, Coffin called that the open mouth hum. Dosher called it Coffin's standing wave exercise. And Ingo Tisa suggests we should call it the manually occluded vocal tract posture. Get it? <laughs> Manual. Okay. So, these are all SOVTs where you kind of put a lid on the pot. You know, the, the vocal tract is partially occluded while you vocalize. Okay. Uh, SOVTs have become an accepted part of, you know, kind of an essential toolbox of ingredient for many singing teachers. And the benefits continue to be explored. Here are a few of them. It's a very busy slide. I apologize. Um, maximum flow declination rate. Okay, so that is how quickly do your vocal folds shut off the flow? And we find that when you shut off the flow really quickly, you get a lot of high frequencies generated. Okay, and the, the semi-occluded vocal tract postures tend to help get that real rapid shut off of the flow. So um, when we transfer that into singing, you get strength at high frequencies, which is what we like to have. Um, and the fact that um, you're, you're not getting the big high amplitude kind of vibration. You get the nice quick shut off of the flow and that you're not getting the impact force. Um, also, um, narrowing of the epilaryngeal area, so this is just right above your larynx, and um, a lot of the research shows, for instance, with male singers who really have a good, strong uh, singer's format cluster, that that narrowing there really seems to help get, get that boost. It has to do with a mismatch between the size of your pharynx and that outlet, and that's a longer discussion. Um, breath management, because you're offering some resistance. Um, lowered phonation threshold pressure, so um, taking, it needs less breath pressure to get, to initiate phonation. Um, also you get um, maybe some better head voice sensation uh, because we're getting a coupling of the vibration of the upper surface of the vocal fold. If you kind of think of that lamina propria, the outer layer of the upper surface there, as kind of like the skin on the back of your hand, that the coupling of that movement with some of the changing acoustic pressures above the vocal cords. And then finally, um, I can't imagine ever doing this, but people have put needle electrodes into um, the muscles of the, the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, and they found that um, 
we tend to get a little higher uh, activation of the TEA relative to the CT. There's a little better um, balance there, which then gives you possibly a little richer tone, okay? Um, and a lot of other things, but that's another day to discuss that. So, um, here's a couple of the more obvious benefits in the studio for using these. Um, increased or more steady respiratory support. So everybody do a nice uh, lip bubble. Fine, okay, good. Um, so just having that downstream resistance, you might feel just a little bit better connection breath-wise. Also, in the course of doing that, you probably felt a lot of vibration because you were setting a lot of tissue into motion. So you get sensations here rather than here. Try doing a hum. Hmm. Hmm. Now, ideally, you probably feel that here and not here. Again, a, a benefit. Um, release of habitual tongue and lip and jaw tensions. So if you're doing a raspberry, it's a nice tongue extension. When you're doing lip bubbles, you're knocking around this tissue, okay? Um, there's also release of inhibitions. I mean, it's really pretty stupid and silly looking to go or to go. Um, so if you've got somebody who's inhibited, um, they kind of have to get over themselves to do some of these things. Um, some of them, uh, the lip bubble, the raspberry in particular, um, you get elevation of the soft palate. Not all of them, you know, humming obviously and the, the MOVT, you, your palate is down a little bit. Uh, fronting of the tongue. So another one you could do, it's a variation, instead of doing the raspberry, if you have a student who can't do the raspberry, you just have them hum with their tongue out. Mm -hmm. Give that a try. Okay, so it's a variation on the hum. You get a, you know, and if they get sassy with you, you can just say, mm -hmm. right back out. Okay, so again, some, some, some tongue freedom you might be able to work on there. And some of them also encourage uh, a little lower laryngeal position. And we'll explore that in just a little bit. So, um, for some of them, as you just felt, you can approximate vowels while you do them. And I think you can find, um, you can approximate or think at least some vowels while doing most of the ones we've tried. So, let's try a few. So, during a lip bubble, okay. <laughs> now the building is doing an SOVT. That's great. Um, let me whip my whistle here for just a second. Okay. So um, I'm going to demonstrate doing a lip bubble, and I'm going to do E A A O U while I lip bubble. You hear some change? Try it. Um, doing the raspberry, and I'm going to do ah, 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 ah. Try that. Okay, yeah. Um, with the hand over your mouth, again, let's do e, a, ah, o, u. Um, with your straw. Again, you can do different vowels. Again, let's just do the E A A O U. Very good. Um, finally, um, with your finger up against your lips, uh, bilabial fricative thing. Let's try a siren on an E. Just listen to it once. Try that. Okay, now try ooh. Uh huh. So you want, you know, your finger up there fairly firmly. Okay. So, what vowels should be used with those SOBTs? that uh, allow the vocalist to approximate vowels. Are there more advantageous vowels to use than others? 
Should you use the same ones for work with a straw versus a lip trill or the manually occluded vocal track? Should you use the same ones for treble and tenor baritone bass voices? Should you use the same ones at, at all pitch levels? And so drawing on some uh, lab research and just some studio experience, I hope to try to answer some of these questions and give you some practical guidance for what you do in the studio or in the practice room. Okay, nasty words there. Our vocal tract has different resonance frequencies, depending on how it's shaped. So I can probably best demonstrate that by just thumping on my cheeks. Okay, so I'm changing my shape, you hear a different pitch. And you can also do it this way, this is the way Coffin used to do it. You're hearing first resonances that way. And if I whisper, you probably hear a descending pitch. You can also thump your teeth and get that, but I don't want to do that right now. Because it hurts my finger a lot. So, our vocal tract has different resonance frequencies, and when we're vocalizing, we want to stay on the lower side. So if you're thinking like, okay, here's a resonance peak. I'll do it this way. Okay, so if frequency is going this way, so lower to higher, and there's a peak where there's a really strong resonance. We want to stay on this side of it. We don't want to get on this side. Um, if we're on the lower side of the resonance, we're in a zone where the acoustics of our vocal tract assist in maintaining vocal fold vibration. And when we use the semi-occluded vocal tract postures, one of the things that definitely happens is that first resonance is lowered way low, like below 200 hertz. Um, another thing that may happen is that the area just above the vocal folds, that epilaryngeal area, is narrowed. But that's not true for everybody. Um, it isn't true for me. I was a, a guinea pig in a research subject that Ingo was doing, and we were doing stuff with the straw, and I was getting um, scoped, flex scoped at the same time. And when I sing high in, you know, opera man voice or whatever, that, er that area does close, narrow down, and that gives me a lot of the ring in my voice. But when I was doing it with the straw, it didn't. And he was fascinated by that. He says, oh, that's very interesting. I was like, well, Ingo, this is just me. This is what it does. And actually, I'm not the only one. Um, I'm not a freak of nature, much as many people probably think I am. Uh, anyway, um, so when we uh, stay on that lower side of the peak, that's the best place to be. If we, if we flip over it, then the acoustics of the vocal tract are actually kind of not assisting. They're kind of impeding. Um, that maintaining of uh, the vibration. And there's a short little article by Ingo, I gave you a reference there if you want to catch that. And then I've got a lot of references in your handouts. So, after thinking about this, I had one of those aha moments. When we do these occluded things, the resonances of the vocal tract lower, especially the first one. Um, so we really shouldn't worry so much about what that first vowel resonance is. And that's really contrary to what we do when we're talking about vowel modification for normal open-mouthed singing, uh, particularly um, for treble voices. So essentially, we've kind of hopped over it. And now we're, uh, by having that narrowing at or near the very front of our mouth. and so. We're using um, that second resonance, and which vowels are uh, which vowels have that second resonance very high? Well, that's typically the front vowels, so your e, i, a, e, okay, a. When you're going to go really, really high, I'm going to hopefully make the case here, um, doing some of these um, semi-occluded things, using the front vowels is probably the more advantageous route to go. That way we can stay on the lower side. Remember, here's my resonance peak. And as frequency is increasing, I can stay on this side of it, 
because if I was using uh, a back vowel that had a lower second resonance, I might not maybe have that advantage. So with that aha moment in mind, um, we've done two studies so far at UTSA to see what happens to the resonance frequencies of these vowels when you occlude. Uh, my former grad student, uh, Sarah Amiga, and I have looked at the, the MOVT, the hand over the mouth one, and I'm in the midst of doing uh, some analysis of data uh, using basically the same um, experimental uh, protocol, but using a standard drinking straw like you've got. And I've recently been in touch with Ingo about doing some further testing and modeling. And hopefully I want to look at the cup thing as well because a number of speech pathologists like to use it. So here's two images. Um, I'm going to put this down so you can see it a little bit better. Hopefully you guys can see the screen there fairly well. Um, the top one is someone singing an ah vowel normally and then the bottom one is doing it with the with the MOVT. That's okay, I'll just talk louder. Um, so, how you get the resonance frequencies in vocal fry? You use vocal fry. So if I sing, ah, and I drop down into vocal fry, that tends to fill in the gaps between the harmonics. And if you look over here, so here's the harmonics of my singing, or actually I believe this, yeah, this may have been me. Um, but then when we go into vocal fry, it fills in all the gaps between the harmonics and it enables us to see very clearly where those resonances are. Um, and you might be able to see here with the occluded posture, so this is the, this is the open one. There's the first resonance. Here's the occluded one, and it dropped way down here. So this is 676, and this is probably in the around 200. And what's interesting, yeah, that's really not going to go over well when someone's singing delicately. Um, I don't know if anyone can find Jeff and let him know about that to the end. That would be wonderful. Um, here's the second resonance, and it actually jumped up. And when you're doing the, the manually occluded uh, vocal tract posture, you get the impact not only of the fact that your mouth is closed, um, but your nasal port is open, and so it does some really funky things to some of those resonances. We'll see that especially in the next slide. Okay, so the top one, this is a female subject uh, singing an E vowel, and then she did it doing the manually occluded posture. So pretty typical, uh, she's singing on C5, so she's actually probably not singing E. She's opened it a little bit. So this is around 500 hertz. And then her second resonance is here, and her third one is here. They kind of merge together, and so we get a really broad um, hump there. This is when she's got her hand over her mouth, and we get lots of little peaks and valleys, but it never really drops super-duper low. Um, but very, very different um, spectrum when you've got you know, not only your mouth occluded, but also the, the velum is down. Um, so we've also looked at what happens when you use the MOVT as a lead-in in the singing, because as I've said many times to Ingo, you know, the semi-occluded things are great, but you gotta open your mouth sometime. Uh, we don't go on stage and sing. Um, so, um, we looked what happens when you use the MOVT as a lead-in to a sung vowel. Uh, for instance, if you go, I'm doing an A vowel. So you're using it as kind of a pilot into the vowel that follows. Everybody want to try that? Good, try it one more time. back 
bad days of playing cowboys and Indians. I know that's probably politically incorrect nowadays, but boop, boop, boop. yeah. Um, this is the way you typically use it in the studio. Uh, and we wondered if some of the lowering and kind of clustering of some of the resonances during the MOVT posture might transfer over into the singing. And in some cases it did, in other cases it didn't. Um, this is kind of a plot. And you can see during the um, occluded part, this is before, this is during the occluded part, these are where the resonances lie, and then this is after. Um, in both of these cases, we didn't exactly see that. Some of the things we did see, though, was some changes in um, uh, a little more high frequency energy, strength and high frequency energy. That was one of the main findings. Um, so we've examined other changes as well, and for that information, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards, or you can wait until we finally get the article uh, finished up in, in the Journal of Voice. Um, this is our second study looking at what happens to resonance frequencies when you sing through the straw. And so to do this, and it is a little bit odd, but I'll let you guys try it. Um, so I'm going to sing an E vowel into the straw and then I'm going to drop in a fry. Give it a shot. Yeah, kind of, kind of an interesting feeling. Okay, so just as before, this top slide, this is just singing. Uh, she's actually doing ooh. Ooh. And so by dropping into fry, here she is singing, and she drops into fry without changing the shape. That's critical, because you're trying to get the, the resonances, the resonance frequencies of that shape. So you don't want to go, ah. You want to go, ah, and not move your mouth or tongue or anything. So here she is just doing the, the regular vowel. And again, she's got first resonance. Uh, she was singing C5, so she raised, it's really probably not a real ulu vowel. So here she is. This is about 500 hertz. This is just a little under 1,000. And she's got something up here at 3,000 and about 3,700. This is going through the straw. It lowered the first one. I wasn't lying, it actually does that. It lowered the first one. We have a little, hmm, not quite sure what that is, and then another peak here. So it definitely lowered stuff, and then we really don't get much of anything um, up higher. Um, we found that the signal of the fry going through the straw is really weak. Um, and so we're looking at some other ways to find those resonance frequencies, such as using a glissando through a straw. Okay, and so this is um, actually me. Um, this is what it looked like through the straw, a, a, a peak here and a peak here and a whole bunch of nothing, because it's just a really weak signal and it's hard for the microphone to pick it up. But if you do a glissando, and I'm letting the, um, I'm letting the software, this is uh, an older version of Voce Vista than what um, Chris Besh was showing yesterday. Um, you allow it to run for several seconds and then it's averaging the, uh, it's averaging kind of where the strong peaks are. And so the glissando seemed to work a whole lot better for giving a little better, you know, clarity. Um, picking up that little bump that didn't show doing the fry, and this one is a whole lot clearer and easier to see. And something there, and that may be an anomaly out there, not sure. So still going through some of that uh, data, but um, the glissando may be the better way for us to go. Okay, well on to the practical stuff. Now that I've probably put you to sleep with all the sciencey things, um, let's get on to the practical stuff. So with the lip buzz, it's been my studio experience um, to use uh, the U vowel, the O vowel, the E vowel, like in schön, or V in French, and the, you know, the OE, so like in Kör, um, with the lip buzz for my male students. It seems to encourage 
a little more stable low laryngeal position. So, gentlemen, um, let's do a descending scale. I'm going to scoot over to the piano and give us a note. Okay, so we're just going to do it's back. You remember that note now? Yeah, that's like E flat. We won't see. Let's do a lip bubble, just a descending scale, thinking ooh while you do it. Okay, uh, now let's um, go up a half a step, so, and uh, try thinking like the vowel in cur, so the, the OE, okay, so. Yeah, gentlemen only, okay? Now guys, take your, uh, take your fingers and just kind of lightly monitor where your larynx is. Okay, let's go up another half step, so bum. All right, and thinking the U vowel like in schön. Hi, ah, there's the D. Okay, there's your pitch, guys. Go for it. Okay, what'd you feel in your larynx do? Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it kind of stay where it is? How many say up? How many say down? Jesse, yeah, well, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're a plant in the audience, okay? But stayed about the same. Ish. Okay, cool. Certainly didn't go up. That's good. Um, with treble voices, I find doing the ah during the lip bubble to be helpful if you're doing really high range stuff. Um, it's great that Rebecca's here, because you're, you're a really high soprano. Um, so let's do a siren, starting about here and just whoop, way on up, okay? And thinking, ah, while you do it. Trouble voices, go for it. Yeah, one more time, give it a shot. All right, cool. So, thinking ah, it gives you a lot of those forward sensations and then your lips are flapping away. Cool. Um, the raspberry. It was Barbara Dosher's habit to use the ah during a raspberry in the upper passaggio area with treble voices and I tend to agree. Um, I'm gonna play F5 here, so. All right, so do a nice, vigorous raspberry on that note, thinking at at the same time. All right, yes, some of you are choosing not to partake. That's okay. It is, as Dosher would say, there's a high spit factor. Um, I should mention that there are three different kinds of raspberries, and again, I'm, 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 these are Dosher's pet names for them going from lowest breath pressure to highest breath pressure. So there's the moped. Okay, try that. Just kind of chill out on the breath pressure. If people are new to doing a raspberry, that's the one you want them to do first, that they're not over pressurizing it. It's just very relaxed and there's a lot of flow. Okay, so if you're thinking, the balance of flow to pressure, there's a lot of flow, and there's not a lot of pressure, right? There's just, you're not, got a whole lot of drive behind it. Okay, then there's the dirt bike, which you'd use maybe a little higher. Okay, a little higher. Okay, so, you know, you have your foot a little bit more on the gas there, right? Okay, so it's a little higher breath pressure, but still there's a lot of air going out. Okay, and then if you get high, high stuff, like up in your passaggio, um, the Harley Davidson. Okay, so this would be the... Okay, give that a shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a much higher breath pressure on that one. Um, so, try that again and thinking the, the A vowel. Okay, on that same pitch. 
Make up on Harley out on the highway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay, Linda. It's all right. You're fine. Okay, now, now that's that's just doing the, the raspberry part. But of course, the whole point of this is not just to do raspberries and lip buzzes, but to use them as lead-ins into singing. So, treble voices. So, doing an at end of the rap with the raspberry, and it's that revved up raspberry, then you're gonna go to an a ah vowel. Okay, so first, before we go up there into a critical zone, just on this note, ah, and just release into a vowel. Great. Okay, so now up here, just the uh, treble voices only. Okay, I don't want an explosion to occur, okay? So, um, with that kind of revved up Harley Davidson raspberry, doing an ad vowel at the same time, and then release into the ah. You got all that? Release into the ah? Release into the ah. So you're going to switch to ah when you come out of the raspberry. Yeah, while you're raspberry. Yeah. Okay, go for it. I could not ask for better comic timing. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So it's a way to get that that you know high intensity singing with a lot of airflow. That's the main thing you're after with the raspberry. Um Okay, um, about the, the manually occluded thing. Um, I've got a lot of things about that in your handout. Um, it's been my experience that the, the front vowels work best with this, especially for uh, your treble voices. Coffin has literally tons of exercises in his books on this. Um, and, and I gave you some samples there in the handout. Um, for, for the um, tenor baritone bass voices in the room, let's go back and do an A vowel into your hand. So you're doing... Try it. Okay, so now we're going to do that as a lead-in to singing an O vowel. So just kind of check it out. So you're doing A into your hand, and then when you take your hand away, you switch to O. Okay? Now, it was Coffin's thinking, because he actually, back in the days before universities had real strong IRBs, he was fluoroscoping people, which is like x-rays, okay? Uh, he was fluoroscoping people, and he found that the uh, some of the constrictor muscles, particularly the superior constrictor muscle, which is one of our swallowing muscles, released when you did this. Um, I don't want to scope you to figure that out. I, you know. Anyway, there are better ways. Um, so female voices, let's try doing an at into your hand, and we're going to siren around. So just. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. Okay, now try an A vowel. Try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now try an E vowel. Okay. Which one feels the best? The A felt the best for you. Yeah, it, you know, I think that's going to vary on, on an individual basis. Um, the, of all three of those vowels, they all have very similar um, second resonance frequencies. Um, the E has the highest of all of them. And if you're going to go really, really up into dog whistle territory, that might be the better choice. Um, but again, you've got to do what's comfortable. Um, okay, doing the straw stuff. I'm looking at my time here, better. So long. Yeah. So with the straw, I found the ooh to be very helpful for some male voices. Again, with you know, we're just wanting to encourage that stable, comfortably low larynx position. Um, students say they feel very open and spacious internally when they do this, although they're probably not actually 
open and spacious throughout the whole vocal tract, they're probably feeling some narrowing, because where we feel like it's open is actually where it's narrow. You're feeling the acoustical pressures, which is very, very hard to get your brain around, but if you, you know, for instance, how many of you have seen what it looks like when someone's being scoped while they're doing an ah vowel? Okay. We all think of ah as being the vowel that has the most space, but if you look at somebody getting flex scoped doing an ah vowel, the back of their mouth area is, the pharynx is very small. You can't even see the vocal folds often. Okay? That's why they have you do E when they scope you, because that gets your tongue forward and the pharynx is actually the most open on the E vowel. But that's very counterintuitive because we tend to be very oral space oriented in how we feel things. Okay, so, um, so lower voices, let's try an ooh through a straw. We're just going to go ooh. Give it a shot. Ooh. Up a half. Okay, great. All right. Now for high sirens, um, you know, uh, the tenors and so on in the room. Again, an E vowel I find works really, really well. I can, I can glissando on that way, 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 way higher than I could sing with my mouth open. Um, I find that um, E is best for most female singers below about C5, so octave above middle C, and then probably A above C5. Again, we're just trying to stay on the lower side of that resonance peak. So, um, yeah, this is like the last big slide here. So, female voices, um, treble voices, let's do an A vowel through your straw on this pattern. Okay? Great. Okay, now take your hand and put it, you don't want to plug the straw up because you're not going to get any sound that way. You can try it, but it's not going to feel very good, okay? But just have your hand there as a way to kind of monitor that, yes, there is some flow coming through. I mean, the straw does restrict the flow, um, but we want to make sure that we are getting a little bit. So try that arpeggio again. And you'll probably feel a little bit of air coming out. Um, I just had the brass player syndrome happen there. So. Um, so yes, that might also happen too. So now what I want to do is alternate. So do the arpeggio through the straw and then take a breath and then we'll just do it on ah, okay? Now take a breath and sing the arpeggio. Ah. that the forward buzzy sensations that you feel with the straw and uh, just the easy gliding that you have with the straw, then when you sing right after that and you're going to alternate back and forth so you get some of that transfer, hopefully the production uh, benefits that we get from the, the straw phonation would transfer over and you know so you alternate back and forth like that. I have on occasion had students sing vowels from a passage in their rep through the straw and then take the straw away and sing it normally. Uh, some people find this more beneficial than others and they're, you know, they're, they're doing the vowels. So, you know, if they were doing, I don't know, caro mio ben, you know, they would be doing those vowels. And then take the straw away, sing the passage right after. Um, I find my high soprano students find this helpful if they've got uh, middle voice stuff, you know, because their, their high voice is great, but sometimes their middle voice is a little more challenging. Um, and they seem to find this approach to be very helpful for kind of helping that middle voice settle down a little bit. If a student finds it's helpful, it's worth a try. So, um, yeah, much like the straw, and got to wrap it up here. Um, it's been my experience using the, the fricative with your finger up against your lips that using, um, particularly with treble voices, 
doing the, the front vowels E or A. So your choice, you can do either one. And we're just gonna do a siren. Yeah. You know, if we had had this presentation yesterday afternoon for Halloween, that would have been great. <laughs> uh, making all these crazy noises. Okay, um, then you could use that as a lead into a scale. Everybody can try this. So we're going to do an E into your finger, okay? And then, give it a shot. Tender baritone bass voices, you could also use again like ooh or uh. Alrighty. So take home points. The vowels used during the SOBT postures can uh, should be chosen according to what frequency range you're singing, um, whether you're trying to do some things with laryngeal height um, for the tenor baritone bass voices, and to promote some greater freedom. Okay. And it, it does seem kind of counterintuitive that putting the lid on the pot can give you freedom, but um, speech pathologists have been using these things to great effect. Um, and, and singing teachers have been for probably the last 25 years or so. Um, if you think of Coffin using uh, some of these things, probably 50 years. Um, and you're wanting to use, uh, particularly if you're going really high frequency stuff, use those um, Vowels that have the high second resonance, so that's going to be your front vowels, to stay on that lower side of the peak. And um, that's my contact information. And I have three minutes to answer a question. Julianne. For students who can't do a raspberry, yep. rather than just a little lip trill and everybody relax, et cetera, do you have any actual uh, some, some good tips for Steps to get the raspberry to work? Yeah. yeah. Um, First of all, I found uh, the, you know, the lip bubble is a great place to start. And then, um, you know, the fact that they can't do the raspberry typically tells you two things. Um, they're backing up too much breath pressure when they try to do it, and there's probably their tongue is wanting to engage the minute they try to phonate. So I find that the tongue out hum is a nice bridge, because then they get used to making a sound with their tongue extended. Hmm. Mm, mm, okay, and then, you know, so I will do lip bubble, and then I'll have them do the tongue out hum, and then after that gets really, really comfortable, then we might do an unvo try for an unvoiced raspberry, and if that works, then we go from unvoiced to voiced. You know, because typically when, when their tongue grabs, and, and I certainly was that way, um, back in the day, um, the minute they start to make a sound, the minute they start to voice, their tongue will retract. And that's the habit you're trying to break. And so doing things that get them used to the tongue extension first, and then gradually adding voicing back into that. Yeah, it's, it's a very silly thing. Yes, please, have fun. <laughs> One other question, and then I know I have to scram out of here. Wow, I've either befuddled you all or bored you all. That's great. Thank you very much.